So I'm Fernanda Lechi. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin, and I'm joined here today by Mark Sanders from the Austin Technology Incubator, also part of the University of Texas at Austin, and uh, Drs. Carl Haas and Olaf Weber from the University of Waterloo. And we also have two initial team members, Scott Beckman from PCL and Sarah Drumming from the Smithsonian Institution. So today's objective is to define circular economy and related topics as they relate to our capital projects industry. We also want to be able to understand the benefits of circular economy to the capital projects industry. We're, we're going to present some preliminary results that will illustrate how other companies in the built environment are adopting circ circularly around the globe. Um, and we also hope to engage prospective team members to our research team, RT380. We're kicking off this coming November. So that's the object, the main objective here of this webinar is to, to engage more CII member companies in this research team. So like Daniel said, if you're interested, contact Christy Delaney to, to uh, become part of this research team. So uh, this, this team is, is, is composed of uh, representatives from both industry, so we're looking for additional team members. Right now we have representatives from PCL, Smithsonian, and Fluor. Um, and uh, the academics in the team are, uh, like I said, from the University of Texas at Austin and the University of Waterloo. But we're definitely hoping to increase our uh, representation there from uh, the industry. So if you um, are inter interested, again, please contact us. Um, and I would like to hand it off to Professor Carl Haas, uh, who will uh, give us a, a little primer there on circular economy. Carl? Thank you, Fernanda. So I know that a lot of the people, if they're interested in the subject and they're on this webinar, already have some background in this area. That, uh, that said, for, for those who don't, we thought it'd be worthwhile to have a, a quick introduction to get us all on the, on the same page. And so I see you're on the next slide there. Yes. So about uh, about four years ago, the World Economic Forum people, and these are the people who run something called the DeVos Conference every year. Uh, they were working with the Boston Consulting Group and produced a series of reports on sustainability, the built environment, shaping the future of construction and the circular economy. Well, one of their conclusions in all these uh, extensive reports and analyses was that adopting circular economy principles could significantly enhance global construction industry productivity, saving at least $100 billion a year U.S. So there's big opportunity here uh, from a business perspective and a, and a social economic perspective. Next slide, please. So some of these potential savings are rooted in the fact that we currently waste so much. We've got 569, 70 million tons of uh, construction and demolition waste in the U.S. just in 2017. And the good part about this is already 40% of this waste is being um, reused, recycled, or, or sent to energy facilities. Uh, that's great, but it, it also means that 60% of the waste was, was dumped directly into landfills and much of the recycling ends up back there as well. So what we're doing is we're depleting the world's biological and abiotic resources in a way that's not sustainable. So uh, next slide, please. It's, and it's not sustainable because of this waste and because our, the way we consume those resources is not efficient. Our economy relies on, you know, a fast turnover principle or a short design life uh, objective that promotes early obsolescence. And you know, a part of that may be minimum attractive rates of return that are stuck in the, you know, inflationary ideas of the 80s or 90s. But uh, there's other reasons too. Um, and so, uh, you know, the idea is the faster we replace almost everything we consume. The faster the economy grows, we you know built on the momentum of speed and resource flows. But by doing that, we currently the way we're doing things is we're also uh, increasing pollution at the same rate. Um, 
And, you know, you can see this in other numbers in Europe, about 95% of the waste of virgin material, or sorry, the value of virgin materials is lost after one use cycle. Um, and this is across most categories. So, and the result is that, you know, the construction of sector as a sector of the economy accounts for about 30 to 40 percent of all material flows in the economy, and thus that's what's generating the huge waste and and uh, problems in the economy. Um, in fact, it's the largest consumer of raw materials in the world, and it consumes about three billion uh, tons of raw materials a year in uh, a huge and 50% of the global steel production, for example. So anyway, so we're running out of things like aggregate sand and water. Next slide, please. And it turns out this consumption is not shrinking. We haven't reached peak global population or peak uh, prosperity yet. We hope we hope we never reach peak prosperity, but we haven't reached peak economy in a in a traditional sense. Um, so raw materials consumption set to double by 2060. 50% uh, of the global infrastructure still hasn't been built. Um, and it's becoming really critical to find uh, alternative means of sourcing and using materials. Next slide, please. So one of the ways of doing this is to move away from a linear economy to a circular economy. So maybe at, at the... At the um, cost of perhaps uh, repeating myself a little bit, most of the built environment currently operates on a linear system based on the you know current economic system that we operate in. And it's based on this idea that we take out of the ground we make and we and then we throw away, we take, make and waste. Um, and you know that that's inefficient. Um, so it produces these sorts of negative impacts that we've been talking about in the preceding slides, and, and they're called extern externalities by economists. But what it really means is that things are, that are not accounted for in a normal economic system, and the people who uh, produce these costs don't pay for them. Uh, and that's kind of the situation in a linear economy in a lot of ways. And the downside is we've got these rising carbon emissions, increased pressures on landfills where we can't even ship stuff to other countries anymore, uh, you know, unsustainable levels of water extraction in most places in the world and a lot of ecosystem pollution. So the alternative to all this is a circular model in the next slide. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I was, <laughs> and so, um, and so the, the idea of the, Recycling, downcycling, and reuse strategy is to attempts to in, integrate uh, this concept of circular economies to reduce waste. So a circular economy decouples growth from resource consumption, and a circular economy maintains components and the materials at the highest value as possible. Well, a lot of slides, a lot of words, but what we thought would be all useful would be to sum up these ideas uh, in a quick um, uh, and very short video from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Thanks, Fernanda. Living systems have been around for a few billion years and will be around will, for many more. Will be around for many more. In the living world, in there's the no living world, there's no land. Instead, materials Instead, flow. Materials One flow. species waste is One another species food. Waste. Energy is provided by the sun, things grow, then die, and nutrients return to the soil safely. And it works. Yet as humans, we've adopted a linear approach. We take, we make, and we dispose. A new phone comes out, so we ditch the old one. Our washing machines are off, so we buy another. Each time we do this, we're eating into a finite supply of resources and often producing toxic waste. It simply can't work long term. So what can? If we accept that the living world's cyclical model works, can we change our way of thinking so that we too operate a circular economy? Let's start with the biological cycle. How can our waste build capital rather than reduce it? 
by rethinking and redesigning products and components, and the packaging they come in, we can create safe and compostable materials that help grow more stuff. As they say in the movies, no resources have been lost in the making of this material. So what about the washing machines, mobile phones, fridges? We know they don't biodegrade. Here, we're talking about another sort of rethink. A way to cycle valuable metals, polymers and alloys so they maintain their quality and continue to be useful beyond the shelf life of individual products. What if the goods of today became the resources of tomorrow? It makes commercial sense. Instead of the throw away and replace culture we've become used to, we'd adopt a return and renew one where products and components are designed to be disassembled and regenerated. One solution may be to rethink the way we view ownership. What if we never actually owned our technologies? We simply licensed them from the manufacturers. Now, let's put these two cycles together. Imagine if we could design products to come back to their makers their technical materials being reused and their biological parts increasing agricultural value. And imagine that these products are made and transported using renewable energy. Here we have a model that builds prosperity long term. And the good news is, there are already companies out there who are beginning to adopt this way of working. But the circular economy isn't about one manufacturer changing one product. It's about all the interconnecting companies that form our infrastructure and economy coming together. It's about energy. It's about rethinking the operating system itself. We have a fantastic opportunity to open new perspectives and new horizons. Instead of remaining trapped in the frustrations of the present, with creativity and innovation, we really can rethink and redesign our future. Thank you, Fernanda. So just to summarize in, in the words of one of my colleagues, we can work toward a circular economy in construction and the built environment by moving away from a linear model to a circular or circular ecosystem where natural capital is preserved and enhanced, renewable resources are optimized, waste is prevented, and negative externalities are designed out. Instead, materials, products, and components are held in repetitive loops, maintaining them at their highest economic uh, and intrinsic value. So that, that's the vision, where's the uh, business potential for our industry? And that's, I think, where we're gonna move to next. Thanks. Thank you, Carl. So I'm gonna go over our research objectives and plan for RT380. So this research, CII's RT380, our objective is to understand the opportunities and value of implementing circular economy in the capital projects industry. So we really hope to learn what other industries are doing and translate that into our business model. So, so as to really highlight the changes that are required in business models of the capital projects industry so we can maximize the value of shifting towards circularity. Um, so the goal is to really develop a set of knowledge and tools for CII members so that they can take advantage of uh, opportunities and value propositions and also key business models for driving a circular economy, economy in the uh, capital projects. So that means we want to uh, make this a viable um, uh, new, new business model, financial as well. We, we hope uh, the value uh, and the relevance of this for CII members um, is, is really uh, to provide these innovations in business models in the capital projects industry 
towards a circular um, economy. And we, we hope that uh, by understanding how to adapt your business models, you can anticipate and prepare for future resource challenges like uh, Professor Haas pointed out. And uh, that way we can build more resilience in the capital projects industry by being prepared for these shortages that will happen um, in the next few decades. Uh, that dependency of new materials will be minimized uh, by creating this, this resilient uh, framework. And we will also add value then to the industry by creating business model innovations. In terms of our approach, um, the initial research team, so we started with some preliminary work over the summer. That's what you see there in those in-depth case studies that you'll hear about from Professor Weber very soon. Um, but our official kickoff will be in November of this year. So if you're interested in what you've heard so far, uh, reach out to CII to join our research team. We'll, we'll be kicking off in, in November. Um, in our kickoff, we're going to be preparing for uh, data collection that will take place uh, within the next year. Um, we'll, we'll plan and execute team field trips, so not just team meetings, but we hope to um, combine, couple these team meetings when it's safe to travel, travel again with uh, uh, team field trips. Um, these in-depth case studies will actually help us um, identify examples of business model innovations that we'll need to accomplish, and that's how we're going to be developing a few future proof proofing analysis for the capital projects industry. What adaptations do we need to be implementing in our projects? And we will be reporting out at the CII annual conference in 2022. Um, so I'm going to uh, pass it on to uh, Professor Olaf Weber. He's going to be presenting some of our pre preliminary findings. Thank you, Fernanda. So um, yeah, I'm happy to uh, present the preliminary findings of our explorative study. As uh, Dr. Leito just said, um, it's, uh, it's first results. So we just started the project. And so it's a first case study to learn about the state of the circular economy uh, in the built environment today. So uh, overall, we have an overview of, of uh, 81 companies, and we are sure that we will add some, some to that. And we have a global uh, overview here. So we have companies uh, from the US, from North America, from Europe, from, from Asia as well. And so you see that the, that circular economy is a topic uh, around the globe. And next slide, please. So again, uh, the distribution in North America, we see a, a kind of a high concentration uh, in, in the West, the coast, but also in, uh, up North. And uh, so again, in, in North America, we find the number of, of companies that are already involved in the circular economy. Next slide, please. And so uh, what are the pr preliminary findings uh, from our scan? So we mainly found uh, seven uh, business types uh, uh, in involved in the circular economy, economy activities. So the, the highest frequency is in, of course, is in waste and material innovation technology. Um, then we see some uh, from the materials and asset marketplaces, some from the service industry, um, automation and software um, contractors, but also consulting and researchers. So companies from there are involved and, and healthcare. Next slide, please. And so this overview shows the different uh, types of business models that we find in circular economy. So the model that is uh, that is addressed most is, uh, of course, waste as a resource. So the question, how can waste be used as a resource to uh, guarantee a circular economy? But then the next group uh, is circular supply. So how can we focus on that? Um, can be in, 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 in uh, how can we focus on circular supplies? Um, resource recovery is a, another big topic. Uh, and then we have the question about reselling. So we are companies that are working on how to resell um, products that are recycled, for example. And uh, others are working on remanufacturing, uh, product life uh, extension, also on repair. Then uh, some of the companies work on product as a service that has been uh, introduced by Dr. Haas uh, just be before here and on sharing platforms for the products that are uh, created and for the um, uh, for, to promote sharing instead of uh, uh, buying. Thank you. Next slide, please. So uh, what do we did we learn about the age of, of the companies involved into circular economy? 
And it's really interesting here, we see that there are some really established companies involved. So that are uh, more than, older than 100 years uh, or older than 50 years, but it seems that it's also uh, a field for new companies and, and even startups that, uh, that are involved and, and coming up with new ideas uh, with regard to circular economy. Next slide, please. So a similar uh, uh, view is uh, on, on the company uh, size. So again, we, we find some global players with more than 5,000 uh, employees there. Uh, so very big companies that are involved in, uh, in, in, the, in circular economy activities. We see a picture here, Fuji is one of those. And, uh, but there as well, we see uh, a lot of companies that, uh, that are smaller uh, have only a few employees and that are active in, in innovative activities uh, with regard to circular economy. So these were the kind of first results. We will continue working uh, on, on this study and to, to get more um, uh, knowledge about what's going on currently with regard to circular economy. And I think uh, next will be uh, Dr. Sanders talking about circularity examples. So I think Dr. Sanders didn't, uh, wasn't able to make it. So I'm going to cover uh, some examples of circularity uh, throughout the project life cycle. Uh, and, and, uh, can you introduce yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was not introduced. Yeah, my name is Beatrice. I'm a PhD student that um, I've been working with the RT380 during the summer, uh, doing all of these interesting case studies. So some examples of, um, of circularity. Uh, we're going to give some examples throughout the project life cycle. The first one is uh, in early design is Alice Technologies. Uh, they mainly focus on design optimization software. And then during construction, um, Katera, they focus on modular construction. Uh, during operation, we have Philips uh, with lighting as a service and in maintenance um, cone, which um, is recently working with predictive maintenance and artificial intelligence. And in the last stage during the disassembly, the AMP uh, robotics with construction and demolition waste recycling. So yeah, Alice um, is a fairly new, new company and Basically, what it is is that it's an AI assistant, so it's an artificial intelligence assistant that helps analyze uh, millions of different construction scenarios and help uh, the stakeholders arrive at the best uh, at, at an optimal solution. So, one example of what they do is, um, is the analysis of several types of schedules, and Hey, Beatrice, and this is Mark Sanders. I'm just going to chime in. You're doing a great job. Uh, and, but I think artificial intelligence is um, is one that construction industry, especially around circular economy, provides a lot of good discrete um, examples and uh, opportunities to use it. Um, and you will see this not only in, in, in the designs phase, but you'll see it in, um, in, the, in the maintenance phase of, and in the, um, the disassembly piece as well. Sorry, next slide. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, I can and I can take over if you want. Um, so Katera is an example of a uh, modular construction. So it's offsite construction company. They focus uh, vertically integrated, focusing on um, multifamily housing. Uh, right now, they're a startup, although they're they have over well over a couple billion dollars invested at this point. So I don't know that I would call them a small startup anymore. Uh, and in modularity, um, offsite construction, uh, pre-assembly is nothing new to CII or its members. Uh, I think what's interesting here is it provides another kind of benefit. So there's a circular economy benefit in terms of waste reduction, increasing quality, which when you increase quality, re, re, you decrease defects and, and increase um, service life and those type of things. Um, a particular interest with Katera is they also use uh, cross laminated timber, which is a, um, has a, a much lower carbon footprint. Um, it's much more regenerative in nature. Next slide. Uh, Phillips, Phillips lighting. What's interesting about Phillips is in this particular case is, um, and I just I can't see the screen. I don't know if anybody else can, but I'm going to just talk from memory. Uh, Phillips screen. The it, what's interesting is their business model. 
which is a, a lighting as a service, which you think about as really a performance-based business model. Uh, so it kind of flips a little bit on the ear, uh, on, on the side of, of what we think of an construction industry as installing assets um, and then having a turnover occur and then, you know, kind of the maintenance through the, through the life cycle of this particular component, uh, building component as owned, operated, maintained, uh, built by, uh, you know, effectively a subcontractor or service provider, in this case, Philips Round Lighting. Uh, but we should be asking ourselves what other systems can be um, thought of as, you know, as a, as a service model, uh, HVAC, energy management, uh, those type of things. So it's uh, the advantages of going in, you know, having this kind of services, uh, you know, there's a continuity. There's a, there's no disconnect between, um, uh, you know, the performance, what we want, and then, then the, the traceability of, of the actual um circularity within of the, of the materials themselves and then you know they can design for disassembly those companies can build around standardization which means there's a lot of reuse and recycling going on but it allows kind of um, experts in those industries to kind of to really think about a life cycle of a product that they service next slide uh, and cone so a lot of you may have seen this commercial um, it's a great commercial uh, where the uh, maintenance technician shows up uh, to an office building, um, nobody has them on the list, and you know he's trying to figure out who called them, and it's the elevator that called them for service. Um, so it's really a partnership with IBM Watson, which is again, this is an artificial intelligence um, application, you know, within the construction industry, and it's really about predictive analytics um, and how predictive analytics are going to help extend the lives of uh, devices and. Um, so that there's, we can do a lot more repair versus replacing um, and just extended life is just a big component piece of circular economy. Just making more, you know, get the highest and best use of the resources we have means like using them as long as possible. And then to the extent you can get ahead of um, the curve on breakage and things like that, it's, it's, it really helps in that case. Um, and then the last slide around is AMP Robotics. Uh, so AMP Robotics is a, it's a relatively new company that's taking, um, uh, waste from a lot of different industries, but specifically they targeted initially construction industry, taking waste from the construction industry um, and using, again, it's artificial intelligence, which uh, like takes camera, identifies different types of waste and is able to kind of like pick and sort. Um, you know, for most of you, you may, may already know, but construction waste accounts for 40 plus percent of municipal solid waste. So taking that waste out of the waste stream is one thing. Um, and then kind of knowing how do you segregate this and put, you know, take those materials, whether it goes to reuse, recycling or upcycled, meaning it goes into it, you know, you take the constituents and put them to, to, into a new product, um, all has to start with the segregation process, uh, um, which doesn't occur today. Um, so the AMP Robotics is really enabling kind of the very end of that, that disassembly piece so that we can take products that are, um, you know, downstream in the construction industry and, you know, potentially you know, maybe even reuse them extractively, the but not necessarily. We can just take those materials and products and, and just reuse them somewhere in our economy. And next slide, and that's it for the examples. Thank you, Dr. Sanders. Um, so uh, now we wanted to transition to a little bit of a conversation with uh, two representatives from um, industry um, who are part of RT380. These are the initial members of, of RT380. So here we have here today with us uh, Sarah Drumming. Um, she's assistant director of the Smithsonian Institution, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, Office of Facility Planning and Business Programs with the um, uh, Smithsonian, and Scott Beckman, director of sustainability at PCL Construction. Um, so I want to start first with uh, Sarah, and um, if each speaker, we're, we're going to, to uh, go through two main points here. First, I wanted to talk about the relevance of circular economy to your business, and then um, if you can tell us, you know, why your organization is interested in being part of RT380. So let's get started with Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Fernanda stated, my name is Sarah Drumming. Um, I work for the Smithsonian Institution, National Museum of African American History and Culture. I am the assistant director of the Facility Planning Business Program Department. Um, as assistant director for the Facility Planning uh, Department for the museum, my job is to take what I learned when I worked for the Smithsonian Office of Engineering, Design and Construction 
those sustainable goals and continue to apply them and maintain it as we continue to manage the systems and just the entire facility that the museum is located in. Um, the relevance of circular economy to the Smithsonian Institution, um, it, it's, it's important because we um, have lots of museums, we have lots of buildings and facilities, um, not just mu museums, um, mind you, we have research facilities, we have educational facilities, we have all type, many types of facilities, and we want those buildings to um, fit in with our economy, we, with our environment. We don't want it to, we don't want to um, use materials, outdated material. We don't want to use material that, that uh, relies very heavily on, on materials that are fading. So um, one of the things we do at Smithsonian, we ensure that in every engineering design construction project, we include requirements for sustainability. We include requirements for pre-consumer, post-consumer material. Um, and we have a huge construction waste management requirement. Um, those requirements are included in, again, in all of our construct engineering design construction documents. And then why is the Smithsonian interested in being part of um, Research Team 380? Um, again, sustainability is a big part of what we do and now a part of who we are. And we want to continue to be a part of the solution. We are a participant now, but we want to be a part um, we want to be a part of the solution, whatever that solution may be. Um, because again, it's a huge part of what we do every day that we walk through the doors to perform our duties. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Scott, would you like to speak? Yes. Hello, everyone. This is Scott Beckman. I'm with PCL and we're a large general contractor and we have about 31 offices across North America and been doing business for about 114 years or so. And the company, um, we have a, a strong interest in sustainability and really that's been growing over the past 20 years as we've been delivering lead projects and other projects with sustainability requirements uh, during that time. Also, last year, we published our first corporate social responsibility report. And with that, one of the, one of the intents of it was to share some of the best practices that we've been doing um, and, and what we've been trying to achieve as a company around sustainability. But uh, another key purpose was to show that um, we, we understand sustainability as a journey and we realize that we don't have it all figured out yet. And so we want to keep engaging our people and keep learning while we're making contributions uh, to improve the industry. And so being a large contractor and doing business across, you know, multiple sectors, including buildings and civil and industrial, um, you know, we often have over 700 projects going at a time. And of course, that results in some really large impacts in terms of carbon emissions, energy use, and construction waste. And so while, while on some projects, we've been able to achieve very high levels of recycling and material reuse um, where the client is demanding that, like Sarah was just mentioning, you know, we can certainly bring our folks together and figure out ways to achieve that. But we also realize that we're part of an industry that contributes, you know, a significant amount to landfill waste. Uh, the statistic you just heard a minute ago, 30 to 40 percent of all landfill waste. So that all of that means that there's really a massive opportunity to do better and, you know, to do better profitably. And but we as a large company, even like um, PCL, we just can't do it alone. Um, we got to work with a variety of stakeholders, um, including the building owners, the designers, manufacturers, um, and government entities, really, if we want to try to start truly moving the needle and integrating more of these circular economy concepts deeper into the day-to-day -day work of, of the industry. And so that's why we're excited. PCL is very interested in participating in this working group. Um, you know, I see great opportunity here to bring a group of experts together and focus on developing some real world solutions that um, hopefully can move us forward towards 
that goal of true circularity uh, in the construction industry. Thank you so much. Thank you both um, Sarah Drumming and Scott Beckman for um, joining us uh, today and being part of RT380. So some of the, I wanted to summarize here before we open up for Q&A. Um, so some of the key lessons and next steps for this team. We really want to understand the value and the opportunities in implementing circular economy in the capital projects industry as part of RT380. We would like to also highlight Adapta adaptation changes that need to be made in business models to really maximize the value um, of shifting towards uh, circularity in the capital projects industry. And we would also like to develop knowledge and tools to help CII member companies future-proof the capital projects industry via circularity in face of all of these resource shortages that we will face in the, in the coming decades. So my ask here, um, is for you all, if you're interested, uh, to come and join RT380 and really help shape the future of our industry um, via circularity. So I wanted to wrap up uh, today uh, while we transition into a Q&A by sharing um, a little uh, video here of um, an interesting project um, which will be the 2022, one of the stadiums in the Qatar uh, World Cup. So thank you everyone for joining us today and, and we'll, um, I'll, I'll hand it off to Daniel 
um, to handle the Q&A. Thank you, Fernanda. Um, thank you, Fernanda and the panel um, for the very interesting insights, uh, examples. Uh, we do have a number of questions here. I'm gonna go over the questions. Um, I'll leave here the Q&A and Christy Delaney's contact. So if you, are, if you work with a CIA member company and you wanna participate in the project, please um, send a note to Christy. She will follow up with you um, our research projects are, you know, um, they, they are reserved for our research mem for our members to participate. Um, if you are not a member and you are interested, you can send us a note, and eventually, that when the team collects um, case studies and data, and, and if you are an expert that you want to contribute, the team can contact you. Although participation in the team along the um, two years or so that the team will work is is really only for CI members. I uh, wanted to, to just to clarify that. So we have um, a few questions here. Um, I think we had some early questions that probably were somehow addressed. Um, but one is like, what is circular economy? Um, and I would say, we'd ask if the team had anything to say beyond what was presented in the, in the slides. Um, I think a, a related question is, um, Um, is it just recycling materials in the future or there are other issues to consider in the project phase? So I think some some of the presentation addressed those. I, I don't know if you have something to add. And Fernanda, maybe may Carl, can do you want to uh, address that one? Can you cover those slides? Hey, Carl, we may need to unmute you. Okay, sorry, I'm back with the program here. Um, the I got distracted. Uh, somebody walked in, so <laughs> sorry about that. Can you repeat that, uh, for, for Daniel? No, two two questions that were somehow addressed already, I think, in the presentation. But I just wanted to see I've if been... the team had had some add. What is circular economy? And then a related question is: Is it just recycling ah. uh, materials or? Uh, there's more, and I think you okay. talked about yeah, yeah. it. Just yeah, I was reading through all the questions, and there's so many that I could, okay, thanks. Yeah, um, it's a lot more um, than recycling. The ideas are that you would um, uh, reuse and as well, and also maintain better, and so uh, sometimes rehabilitate, refurbish, that sort of thing, and a lot of that uh, would be based on how you design uh, in the future. Um, so, but also there's some opportunities for reuse as opposed to recycling um, in some pretty innovative ways of uh, deconstructing, uh, disassembling instead of demolishing. And uh, that's even become a sort of an opportunity. Uh, in Europe, there's a couple countries where they're um, letting contracts uh, for innovative ways to uh, take materials and components out of a uh, facility for reuse and uh, you know all you have to do is is do it for you can make however much money you want to make off it but all you have to do is do it for less than it would cost to demolish so th there's some real opportunities other than recycling I'm not sure if that completely Daniel, there's the actually a question that I think you would be uh, better at answering, which is uh, looking at what is the time commitment for um, CII members that would like to be part of this research team? And maybe you can address that. Yeah, sure. Um, there are a couple of related questions. I think one is on the time commitment, and there's one that is about the duration. Um, so traditionally, CI member companies nominate uh, one representative to, uh, to a research team, and that person meets with the team regularly you know, over, over the duration of the project. Right now, we're probably speaking of virtual meetings um, for the next at least six months. We, we don't know when we're gonna go back to somehow normal travel. Um, so mostly, probably monthly, meetings uh, plus some off offline work 
by one person and um, with their company. So that's really the allocation of resources is, is the time of one person for that duration. This project will kick off in November and we'll report out in our conference in 2022. So we have a little bit under two years there to go. Um, we wish we should have started earlier this, but the pandemic happened. So we'll be a little bit of uh, below two years, shorter than normal, a little bit. Um, so I think those are the questions. There are other questions here, a couple of questions about industrial products. So I think we heard a, a lot of cases in the commercial construction. Um, someone asked, any examples in the uh, chemical industry? And then someone else asked, uh, would, would like to know the specific applications of circular economy to industrial products rather than commercial housing, commercial construction. Um, you know, it, it is generally assumed that in, uh, industrial products lack circular, um, the circular connect or waste minimization. Um, so, Fernanda, would be, would you answer that? Sure. So I think Mar Mark, can you jump here? Sure. Uh, and, and if I miss the question, somebody can chime in. I mean, I mean, if I, if I don't address the question as it's asked, but um, you know, the first one is kind of industrial processes, um, and you know, I'll kind of pivot to a company that we work with called um, Earthly Labs, and um, they work within the food and beverage industry. So AB InBev, who's who is a member of CII. Uh, has worked with them closely um, in closing the loop around carbon dioxide within their um, brewing industrial processes. So breweries will actually buy carbon dioxide um, from air gas or air liquid or something like that. They'll use it to push um, kind of the product around. Um, but as many of you may know, in the brewing process, you actually produce CO2. Uh, so you're producing carbon dioxide as part of your fermentation process. And what they've done is developed a product and a technology that closes the loop in that industrial process around capturing the CO2. They're able to capture it um, uh, at, at food and beverage grades. So there's all different kind of grades of carbon dioxide. So when you capture something, it's not always pure enough to be used in kind of the food and beverage industry, but they they have a device that does that. So they have a business model where it's like they're able to capture and, and allow the reuse within an industrial process. So hopefully that answers that one. Um, and then on the chemical side, I think it was around chemicals, and it's less about, um, and I'm not sure if this is where the question was going, but um, yes, we work, there's a lot of companies that are looking at, um, you know, like one of them was out of Berkeley that we're working with, um, they call it PDK. So it's an all around the plastics industry, but it's developing a uh, formulation of plastic that are, allows for disassembly. So it may, you know, typically, when you get plastic back, it's just, you know, it's all kind of a, an aggregate that can't be taken apart to its constituents. So they've developed a, a, a kind of a, a use of a, a plastic that can be used for a number of applications that can at an end of life can actually be taken apart to its aggregate pieces. And then those uh, those constituents can be used as if it was the raw material to begin with. So uh, we you know, the first question to Carl was around recycling. So in a circular economy, um, you know, it goes be recycling's, you know, it's it's the step beyond recycling if you think about it. So a lot of the problems with plastics and those kind of like chemical products is recycling, they don't they don't hold the same quality, right? So it's like if you recycle them, it, it's a lower uh, it's a lower graded product than what it originally was. Um, and then around the circular economy, a lot of these things in the chemical side are looking to upcycling, meaning they, you know, they they retain their same structural properties or the same material properties as they originally had, or they're upcycled, meaning they even have stronger or better properties. So, not sure if I answered those questions. That whoever it was can kind of chime in if I didn't. I I might just and, uh, and follow I can, up, or maybe not. Um, <laughs> uh, Daniel, but I, I wonder if um, that I, that was the most fundamental, and best I think answer. And I'm wondering also if uh, we're seeing uh, the uh, process industry uh, uh, thinking about adaptable or designs that are adaptable to different um, material streams. Uh, so when you're designing the plant, Mark, have you encountered that yet? And and what I mean is uh, uh, if we create different circularities of materials flow in the economy, um, it might help uh, process plants to be designed to be more adaptable to to uh, changes of flow 
you know, currently we don't do that so much now, right? Correct. Yeah, I haven't seen any good examples kind of on that kind of the Dutch other than the one I've mentioned. Um, you know, I know some of the things we talked about with Terra with modularity, certainly those things, um, you know, people like are sliding things in and out. It's more on the kind of effluent side or something like that, just modularity around like being able to kind of put equipment in and out um, or just, you know, take, take those processes and move them. But I haven't seen, um, you know, again, on the industrial side, I, I think about it in terms of kind of like the, the stuff flowing within <laughs> the tubes, right? Less so about kind of the building that goes to close that um, process. Yeah, and well, sorry, last uh, little addendum to that is um, the actual physical facility, the capital facility, uh, more and more there's reuse of steel as opposed to recycling and design for reuse or design for disassembly. And it's a it's, it's a little bit crazy right now, but it's going to make a lot more economic sense um, under some uh, potential scenarios that, that uh, appear to be coming down the pike. Thank you. We have another question here is uh, will RT380 address elements of a business plan for companies uh, wishing to get into the circular economy? Yes, so that's part of the work is trying to identify what are the changes in the business model that we uh, we need to adapt as an industry to be able to implement circular economy. So so that's that's definitely one within our scope of work. Um, maybe um, Olaf would like to add um, add comments on that since his expertise is in sustainable finance. Yes, thank you. We will definitely have a look look on that and on both. So the kind of the uh, finance inside the corporation. So how how can you make that uh, a, a, a valid uh, project, for instance? And then also financial as aspects in, in the in the broader scheme. So from an economic point of view. Does it make sense financially if we if we uh, reuse, for example, if we are involved in a, in the circular economy? And what are the uh, the conditions that it's uh, that it will become uh, financially viable as well? There could be issues with you know distance between different companies that exchange their product or their waste and use their waste. So yeah, we will focus on that on the on the corporate level and and on the broader level. And maybe just to the question before, so there's a very interesting example that's called Calendborg. So if someone wants to use that and check that in the internet, and there, the, uh, amongst others, there's also the chemical industry involved there. There's Novos the Times that is involved there and, and other different industries. And this is a main aspect also of circular economy that we have the collaboration between different industries and not only uh, inside one industry. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think there was a question here on what type of um, resources people, like uh, participants, we would be looking for. Um, that's a, a good question. We, you know, the, I'm looking at the panel here today. Olaf is on on this business side, and uh, we have people more on the industrial processes side, like or connections to to industry in the incubator. And Mark does that connection. So I think when I look at a member company, and I know a lot of member CI members are in the oil and gas um, sector, plus chemicals. Um, you know, I think potentially we definitely want connections to capital projects, but we know that a lot of companies have initiatives of circular economy in, in their core business units, and it would be good to establish these connections, right? So I think some people are thinking about the product. Of the circularity of products, but uh, it would be good to make connections to capital projects. So how how we connect those two sides in our companies? Uh, definitely on the business side uh, would be uh, in interesting background. So fr from the business side, to think about business models from the circular economy initiatives, either in capital projects or in your core business, um, and definitely people in the capital projects and management uh, units. Um, any can can the panel think of any any other um, type of expertise or or you know profile that would be interesting to the team? Well, Daniel, I'm I'm just it, partly uh, the answer to that question is the really intriguing questions on the side here that I've been 
you know, there's some questions that raise perspectives that I, I hadn't really thought of and people who seem to have interesting backgrounds. So within the scope of being a member of CII, I, I think we take almost anybody because we want to um, uh, we want to be open-minded at this stage, I think. So I'm not sure if that was quite an answer to your question, but but there's like somebody here had a question about materials markets, and uh, you know it's a whole area. I don't know if that's a construction phase, design phase, what is that? But it's definitely uh, fits within our scope. I agree. So if you think Thank of you, um, individuals that work with supply chain, uh, sustainability, yeah. uh, waste management, um, even project and engineering individuals, um, and, and as well as 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 finance uh, individuals. So all those are you can see that the, the level the expertise is broad. So we do need a cross disciplinary team um, to to be successful in, in RT380. So we we do welcome um, multiple backgrounds and and, and expertise. And this is Mark, and I'll just add, Daniel, I, I think if you were asking specifically around oil and gas and, and those industries, there's you know, the two kind of areas that uh, that specifically come to mind, I think, that they may be interested in are, one, are, are carbon capture um, and storage. And, uh, you know, like there's been a lot of examples recently of, you know, taking ca carbon um, CO2 um, from different, from, from emissions from different power plants, different sources, and kind of embedding those in concrete and different things. So it's just kind of like, how how that stuff can be how how can that the carbon capture be used from those industries in you know building products uh and the other one is around hydrogen production production i know like the oil and gas industry is very interested in kind of like taking um uh, energy and storage and conversion into hydrogen and how that can potentially be used in the circular economy that would be like two very specific examples there was Thank also a question about um, whether we would have uh, members from Europe or other continents. And Daniel, I think that's quite fine, isn't it? Or... Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, as long as you're a CI member company, we are glad to, um, to um, have you in the project. Um, we, more and more, we've seen people um, working, CI members from Japan, Malaysia, um, you know, and we, the team needs to adapt their online meetings and schedule, you know, as, as good as they can to, to accommodate for this uh, time differences. I guess that's definitely something that we want to incorporate in the project, uh, side members from uh, around the globe. We are running out of time. We're three minutes past the hour, and we have many questions here. I'm really glad to see the questions. What I'll do, I'll, I will pass these questions to the team. Um, and see if they can, to the extent possible, address, answer the questions. I think we have our contact information when you when you um, register. And there are comments, there are suggestions, there are very good questions here. So I really wanted to thank you. Thanks every, for everyone that attended today. Um, want to thank uh, say thank you to our panel uh, for the great presentation. Um, and you know I'm excited to start working with you. This November, well, we have started working already a little bit, pre preparing, but you know we'll have a great kickoff meeting in November, and I'm looking forward to working with the team. Okay, thank, thanks everyone. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Th take care. Thanks, everybody. Dave, take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.